we're going to talk about linear approximations of functions today. Uh, what, what do these words mean? They mean we're going to use lines. give estimations of functions. I added a couple words in there which I did not say out loud but wrote. Lines are simple, aren't they? Aren't they? that, we need to do one multiplication. Given some input, we need to multiply it by a slope. And then we need to add a y-intercept. That, that's, that gives you for any input the output for a line, right? That's about as simple as it gets. So we're going to use these simple things to try and give estimations of complicated things. And we saw last time an approximation, or two times ago, I can't remember which one. Sine of theta. That is definitely not a line. But when theta is small, when the angle is small, what's the line that we use to approximate this? Do you remember? It's just that, line of slope 1 and intercept 0, m times x plus nothing, x is our theta. We've seen this before, a linear approximation of a more complicated function. And there's something to note here, these approximations are valid or close And then I'm going to fill in the blank here. Sometimes. Not always. So this is going to be one of the caveats um, of using lines. Um, they're only going to be close or approximate or valid under some situation. Okay. So it's an important thing to remember that when we use these approximations, we're only going to use them when appropriate. And if we don't have an appropriate situation, then we need to change this, the situation so that we can use another line. Because one linear approximation does not accurately reflect all of this curve. We might need a lot of these different ones, maybe different slopes, different y-intercepts, to approximate sine theta. Hey, Fred. Um, okay, so what I'll write in this blank is just this. This approximation is valid or close for theta close to zero. So for this example, when theta is small, the caveat is this approximation is only good when the angle is close to zero. If I give you an angle far away from zero, this is going to be a terrible approximator. It's terrible. Okay? So let me give you just a couple functions here. So at a point, A, that's our x value, some input, and f of A, 
That's the output of our function at that x value. An approximation. of f of x close to x equals a is this one. If I write a y equals y here, this looks quite a lot like what I've got here. I've got an x, albeit it's linked with this input a, but I've got an x that's multiplied by our derivative, which, not surprisingly, remember, tells us our slope. And I've got some plus symbol here. This is really our y-intercept for the line. And on the sideboard, maybe you'll just for, I'll point this out. This really just comes from the point-slope form of a line, which says that if a point goes, if a line goes through x0, y0, and has slope m, then I can construct the equation of this line simply by doing this. That's the equation of a line which goes through the point x0, comma y0, and has slope m. That's what we've got here. y minus this f of a is the slope of the line times x minus a, because this line goes through this point and has this slope f time at Okay. This is a nice little first order approximation, linear approximation of any function f. Okay. We can use this. approximate our function. So for numbers x close to a, our function f of x is approximately this. The function at a plus the derivative at a times x minus a. This is our approximation, our linear approximation. Let's do a quick little example. Your book goes one step a little further. It adds something underneath here. I'll just do this. And actually, I want to want to save it. Tom, thank you for pointing this out much earlier on in the semester. This is a fun topic to think about. Hassan came to me at one point and he said he had watched a lecture online about approximating radicals. And there was like a process for coming up with a square root of some number. And what he was talking about was linear approximations of these things. But this is all part of a much larger um, group of things, set of things called, uh, uh, well, I'll say Taylor polynomials. These are just polynomials that you construct from all the derivatives of a function. And so instead of being just linear approximations, they're linear plus quadratic plus cubic plus quartic plus et cetera, et cetera, all the way down the line. It's the approximation of a function by any polynomial. Anyway, so for this one, 
Let's go ahead and find out what our linear approximation will be. So I'll keep referring to this. This is my linear approximation. Okay. Let's go ahead and find our linear approximation. And we'll use that. find, say, some square root that we don't know off the top of our head, right? So let's say like square root 5. I don't know what that is. But 5 is pretty close to 4, right? It's kind of close. It's one away. So in this approximation, 5 is pretty close to 4, so maybe I can use the square root of 4 and the derivative of this guy to find out some information about the square root of 5. We'll see how close this thing gets us, okay? So first we're going to construct that linear approximator. And we're going to let a equal 4. We might, I don't know, you might consider choosing some different value of a and seeing where that gets you. It's going to give you a different approximator, and one of them might be closer than another, which gives you some idea that there's a, kind of an art to this. Okay. But, uh, we'll choose four. It's closer. So. so what do we need? We need our function value at this. We need that. We need x minus a. Now we need to multiply x minus a by the derivative of this at a equal to 4. So what's the derivative of this? Well, that's a power function x to the one half. So we multiply by the power and subtract one. One half times the square root, so that's one half. Subtracting one gives us minus one half, which is one over the square root of x, of a, I should say. We're evaluating at a. And what is the square root of four? f at a, that's two. So we have our function, our approximating function. It's the square root of 4 plus the derivative at 4 times x minus 4. Uh, that was a poor form of me, so let me put this back in and then I'll... tells us 2 plus 1 fourth of x minus 4 is our linear approximator. And if x equals 5, it tells us this. 2 plus a fourth of 5 minus 4, that's 1. 1 over 4 is 0.25 plus 2. says the square root of 5 is maybe close to 2.25. The square root of 5, just to see, is 2.24. 2.236, etc., etc. That's not so bad, actually. 
It agrees on the units, it agrees on the tenths, and it is 0 .14, 0 0.014 off. Right? About a one hundred plus four thousandths. Pretty stinking close. If I had chosen a different value for A, like let's say nine, the linear approximation would be three. That's the square root of nine, something we easily can compute. Plus one sixth times x minus a, uh, which is nine. Oh, that's convenient. And now if I plug in 5, what does this thing give me? minus two-thirds, right, which is two and a third, 2.33. It's a little further off, right? Still not bad, but it's a little further off. Why is it a little further off? chosen something further away from the from the number that we know information about, you know, 9, and the square root of 9 in particular, 5 is now 4 away. So the information that this slope gives us for predicting is now diluted over 4 units instead of being diluted over just 1 unit away. Right? This slope is what we travel along in our line. And if we travel four units of this slope, that's possibly going to give us more error than just traveling one unit away with that slope. Right? Slope is how far up or down our line moves per unit left and right. If we move just one unit, that's just one slope quantity up or down. If we move four units away, that's four slope quantities. So this, this being close to what you're approximating, that's kind of an important thing. Questions about this process so far? <laughs> Two or three of us. Maybe need to stand up. That's fine. Okay. Linear approximations are pretty simple. Um, if you think about how many steps it would take you to compute the square root of 5 doing some other method, like a bisection search or something, some approximating process. Uh, to get some level of precision, the number of steps could be quite a bit. But perhaps you could do it. And I'm wondering how close linear approximation is with just this one step, right? The one step that we have to do. Take the derivative, multiply by x minus a, and then add f at a. These are all really fast things to do for anyone, on a calculator or on a computer. Right? Computing things for lines is quite fast. All right, so here's sort of a question related to that one.
this is a question in regards to the accuracy of our linear approximator. So this is the function that we discovered. We use it to approximate the square root of 5, and we got pretty close. Now I'm asking sort of this opposite, this inverse question. If I want to guarantee that I'm this close, how far out can I go with x? That makes sense? This original function looks something like this. And this line looks something like this. You can see that if we sort of go too far left or right, the distance this line is from the original function just increases. What this is asking is how far to the left and how far to the right can we go before this distance here or this distance here is bigger than 0.5. Okay, so that, that phrase, close to, is going to be made precise here. Conceptually, we're good to, on that, I hope. Yeah? Okay. How can we determine, or how can we write down a, this in sort of a mathematical description? Something that tells us how far away these values are from each other. How do you find the distance between two numbers and your name can't start with the letter M? Sorry, Morgan. And your name can't start with the letter H. I was thinking of your last name, by the way. Sorry. that one? Very good. How far apart are these ones? 10? 2. How'd you do that? Subtracted, right? Which one did you subtract from which one? Well, you said positive 2. This minus that one? Okay, but does it... What I'm, what I'm suggesting is you're onto it. The order doesn't matter so long as you do what? Take the absolute value. So if I give you any two numbers, x and y, to find the distance between them, you subtract and then take the absolute value, right? Any two numbers. Here's a number, here's another number. If I give you x, square root of x is just some number. And 2 plus a quarter of x minus 4 is just another number. So how far apart are they? The absolute value of number 1 minus, you know I'm going to write it the other way, so we don't have to distribute negative sign. 2 plus a quarter of x minus 4 minus, that's the first number, our second number. This tells you how far apart those are. This tells you how close our approximation is to the actual guy. If I want this distance to be less than 0.5, or within 0.5, I can mathematically describe that by just adding less than that, right? And now this brings back all sorts of bad memories from pre-calculus class, right? <laughs> but this is where it is, right? Calculus 
comes up all over the place in calculus. It should be obvious why. This is a very practical question, too. You've got a really simple function describing something a bit more complicated. Something you could easily tell me the value for given any x, and something you would absolutely go to a calculator for to tell you the value of certain x's. Right, you only know the nice perfect squares for this one, perhaps. But for this, you could just do that in your head most of the time. So, practically speaking, when can you use this approximation? So you pick a level of precision. 0 0.5, 0 0.1. I want to be to the nearest million, right? So 0 0.000, 000 whatever, zero is one. And then this absolute value inequality tells you how close your x has to be in order to get that level of precision or accuracy or whatever. We can debate which word is correct later. Okay. So let's solve this one. With absolute values, there's more work than you think most of the time. There's two inequalities that we need to solve, actually. First, what if the inside is positive? Second, the inside is negative. If this number inside is positive, we have the inequality exactly as it's written without the absolute values. And we solve it. If the inside is negative, we have this inequality. The inside is negative, the absolute value makes it positive by multiplying it by negative 1. Multiplication by negative 1 essentially just means do this. 2 plus a quarter, x minus 4. Uh, if you want to hold off writing this for a bit, you can write this, but don't write this negative in the parentheses. Multiplying that thing on the inside by negative 1 means putting a negative in front. And we have this inequality still. But this is kind of weird, so what we'll do is we'll move the negative over to that side, which means changing the direction of the inequality, adding this negative sign, and erasing these things which I said not to write. So it's the same inside, but now bigger than instead of less than, and bigger than negative of this instead of the positive of it. There's two inequalities to solve. One if the inside is positive, one if the inside is negative. Okay. Questions about this so far? Yes, the next thing we're going to do is try and factor things. It's not going to work out nicely because of this guy, square root of x. The one in the book worked out probably very nicely. Oh, that's hilarious. In the book, they just. That's funny. Okay, the book just jumps right to the answer. That's funny. Okay, yeah, they didn't pick a nice example either. Um, how do you solve things like this? The book doesn't even suggest to tell you. Let's pick the first one. And I'm going to just multiply through if that's okay. So 2 plus 1 fourth x minus 2. Right? Uh, minus 1, minus 1. 4 times 4 is 1. 
minus root x is less than one half. Okay. Combine like terms. Some of us may hate to see things like fractions, so we could multiply everything across by four, and that'll give us that, which is the equivalent. Maybe it doesn't look very familiar, but it is. Yes? Yeah, why? How did you get that? Okay, yeah, we've got a trinomial here, which might, might jog your memory with, like, quadratics. Quadratics factor into two nice terms like this. But I, to be honest, I don't exactly see a quadratic there. I see first power and half power, right? Well, we can make it one, right? Do you remember how to do substitution? Things like this? Okay. I say some variable y is equal to the square root of x. Then what is this x? Substitutionary, substitutionarily. Hmm. Solving this is the equivalent of solving this. And that's a quadratic. Right? And we all know the quadratic formula by heart. As I sang it for you earlier this year. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing it again. The opposite of 4, negative 4 rather, plus or minus the square root of negative 4 squared minus 4 times a times c all divided by twice 1. This is the opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, all divided by twice a, which tells us 4 plus or minus the square root of 16 minus a, the square root of a all over 2. That gives us two possibilities for y. We place those two values here for y. 2 plus the square root of 2 and 2 minus the square root of 2. And then we check values in this interval and in this interval and in this interval. We'll find out where this quadratic is negative or positive. Which would be the same interval more or less from where this thing is negative or positive after translating back. And that will tell us exactly the values between which our original linear approximator is within one half 
of the square root of x if this difference is positive. Okay, still with me on this? Yeah? No? Yeah. Yes, please ask. This is kind of like a dumb question. No, nothing is, like, is not allowed. Go ahead. What, what are we solving for? Like, what will the answer be? Um, great, great. So, yeah, like I, that's why I stopped to ask because we are so far removed from the original question. I didn't want us to lose sight. And if anybody had lost sight, great. Thank you for asking. We're, we're starting off with this question of we've got the square root of x function, which is hard to compute. We've created an approximation for it. And the question is, which inputs, what x numbers, does this thing do a decent job of approximating the square root? Okay, so this is how decent I need it to be. At least this, at most, this far off. So I take the difference of them being at most that far off. This breaks down into two cases. We took the easy one, and we're solving here to figure out how far out we can go and how far out this way we can go until, I'll just suggest right now already, that out here, we're too far away, and out here, we're too far away. This is going to be the sweet spot. When y is in here, that means our linear approximation is going to be within one half. Great. Other questions? No? Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and just proceed from here. If y is 2 plus root 2, or 2 minus root 2, what is x? Well, we find x by just squaring these numbers. y is the square root of x. So if we square 2 plus root 2, or and if we square 2 minus root 2, that means this is suggesting that we can be within those two numbers, and our x, or sorry, our linear approximator will be, will be within 1 half. So it's not even too hard to translate that, because of these quick translations between y's and x's. Okay. I'm not going to compute what those actually are, but you can, you can sort of see. Squaring 2 gives you 4, which is what we use to create this linear approximator. Root 2 kind of is implying that you can go a little bit further than 2 away from 4. Just a little bit further away. Yes? Yeah, you see how hard this becomes. The reason I'm asking is because, with like, how do we input it on this? Yeah, great question. Great question. Um, I created this homework assignment so long ago, I don't even remember, remember what the questions look like. So, let me, oh, at the end of the section, I don't know. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. A lot of the questions stop here. How do you find this? The linear approximator. So several of the homework questions will ask you just to plug this in without worrying about this at all. Okay. Um, there's one more talk as well today about something called a differential, um, which we'll get to in just a few minutes. And so you'll be importing, importing differentials. Then uh, I do remember several questions where I'm asking you to compute this difference. And I'm also asking you to compare the differential with respect to the original function too, which how far off another approximator is. Mm -hmm. So there's questions comparing the two. But uh, yeah, for the most part, it's com coming up with this or coming up with a differential and then comparing to your original, not necessarily finding all of the 
x values between which between which you have the appropriate accuracy. I guess the point here is just to say between that number, which is less than this one, and this one, x is y squared. So between y squared and y squared in that interval down there, right? These are our two endpoints. The translation says to find x, you square those endpoints. So between these two numbers is where our original linear approximation is, a, is within one half, assuming that the linear approximator overestimates your original square root. This is actually the case where it underestimates. It gives you something less than. Okay. Then you need to compare actually where these two intervals overlap. But yeah, great question. Other questions? Two solid questions, very solid. Priya's glancing through the homework, right? Mm -hmm. And did you see any like this? Mm -hmm. Oh, there's one or two. Oh, yeah. Well. Like I said, it's kind of an important thing to know, you know how, how far away you can be from your approximate point, right? So I would assume then what you're going to be plugging in is things like this. Intervals between here and here after you solve for the endpoints. Yes, Brianna. So the whole um, solving if the inside is negative, we didn't need that at all? No, it's not that we didn't need it. It's that we haven't done it yet. Uh, we filled up half a board with the other ones, so just haven't gotten there. It's solved the same way, actually. Um, you would simplify the left, just like we did there. You'd bring this over, just like we did there. You'd convert to a quadratic, quadratic formula to solve the endpoints, test the intervals, and find the interval that works. Right? Exact same process. Other questions? All right. Okay, well for this year's sake, let's go ahead and stand up. Just like take a, take a step up out of your seat and just stretch those knees out. We need it today. The weekend before Halloween's weekend, I suppose, is a tough one. I'll just erase while you're waking up. No judgments, no judgments. You're good. blood flowing. You're good to go for another 20 minutes or so. So what we just worked on was something called a net change. We had some function which gave us some output number for an input x. And we looked at how far away our function was at one point from sort of the, you know, the function in, in the first place, right? This is just this general idea of finding a difference, a delta in some function, 
which I'll just again repeat to us. It's been a long time since we've done this. A change in a function's value, a net change, is the same as taking away the function at x from the function's value at a different spot. Graphically, if this is my function, and I want to plug in x here, and let's say I add 5 to x, this is my new function value up here. So this height is f of x plus 5. And this height here is just f at x. And this difference here, delta y, is that height change. geometric picture for what's going on when we're taking differences with functions. Right? I've kind of showed this just a little bit. Yes, Can you question? Explain the dotted lines? The dotted lines. lines, yeah. Okay, so usually we draw on a flat surface, right? X's are left and right, and Y's are up and down. Mm -hmm. So I drew these dotted lines to sort of give us that, that height and a function tells you a height at an input. When you put a graph down, you're, you're first going over to the input, and then you're going up, up to a height. And I went straight horizontally over to label. You can picture the y-axis here. I'm labeling the heights for these function values. Yeah, I just, I just you know, I just... Drawing that extra axis, you know, that's the extra mile. And, and I still haven't gotten any tips. So, <laughs> you remember that? No, we don't remember that. Never mind. Not funny. I'm not expecting tips. Again, not at all. Anyway. Um, yeah, so the, the dotted lines represent the heights of the function at that input, x plus 5, and at the input, x. Other questions? Alrighty. Well, we've also learned about these things called differentials. Just a little bit. We've seen that. Uh, if I remove this S and I write equation, a differential equation, you've seen an example of that, right? You had this dy dt equals k times y, not t. This was a differential equation to which the only solutions were exponential functions. And these I call differentials. Geometrically, what did they represent? Little deltas very small changes. You remember derivatives are found by letting things, differences go to zero. If I take the limit of this difference as delta x goes to nothing, and I divide it by delta x, that gives me the derivative of our function. That gives me the differential. So I'm going to talk about differentials now. dy, dx. In terms of hopefully something you know here. dy, dx. A tiny change in y, that's this, divided by a tiny 
tiny change in x to make that rigorous. Again, this is the limit as delta x goes to 0 of f of x plus delta x minus f of x all over delta x. This is the derivative of x. Remember, that's what this is. And we can think of this as a delta y divided by delta x as delta goes to 0. And that gives us a little itty bitty change in y divided by a little itty bitty change in x. Differentials. Geometrically, very small change in height divided by a very small change in x. What I'm about to do right now is oh, rewrite this equation sort of naively. If we think of these as little changes, what we're really think of, thinking of them as is little numbers. With numbers, I can rewrite equations. right? So I can multiply both sides by this differential dx. It's just a little number after all. Which tells us that a little change in y is equal to f prime of x times dx. which gives us, actually, another approximator. Inferential approximation. If I want to approximate my function, and I'm not going too far away from x. I'm just going a little, little bitty distance away. So I can write this down. I can say that f of x is very close to f of a plus f of x plus dx, right? If I don't go very far at all, if my function doesn't go asymptotically away from my original input value too far, too fast, if I'm very close to my initial approximation point, I can say that my function x is, I need to double check this. So if I pick some a value, like we did much before with picking 4 for the square root of x, and if I'm going to be approximating f of x really close to 4, so not far at all from a. I'm sorry for the confusion. I was using x's before and should have been using an a instead. If I'm not moving very far from the thing I know at all, and what this says is that there's just a little tiny change in our original function value, which of course is related to this derivative of our function, which we saw in the uh, linear approximation before. We go just a small change from our original value that we know. In other words, I take square root of x plus small number. This says this is very close to the square root of x plus a 
small value here. Okay. If you think about it geometrically from the picture, if I haven't moved very far at all from this x, my delta x is very small, right? So my delta y is also probably not very not very big. Okay. This is this is dependent on the derivative's value as well, which is what we have here. So with this, we can rewrite this. F of a plus dx is approximately equal to f of a plus f prime at uh, a times dx. And that gives you literally your linear approximator. But now, only for values very close to a. Do you remember our linear approximator? It was f of x, I'm sorry, f of a, plus f prime at a times x minus a. And if we make this guy become very, very, very small, x is very close to a, we essentially have this differential, a very small change in x. This comparison, I think, seeing them right next to each other is obvious. Do things with it. Here's a good example. And we'll have plenty of time to work this now. So we're going to take a function which is cubic x cubed plus x squared minus 2x plus 1. two things, delta y and dy, the differential, for inputs as x changes first. from 2 to 2.05, and if we get to it, we'll go along a smaller difference as well. First thing to note is what are these guys? What is our change in x? What is our differential of x? triangle again means a change. So you're taking a difference. Usually it's final minus initial. It's like usually the way in science classes it's said. A change in x is the final value minus the initial value. Okay. What's delta y? That's the final value of this minus the initial value of this. So this is going to be f at x plus delta x. That's this. And this is just
is my x. So f of x plus delta x is f at 2.05 minus f at x. For this one, because I don't want a cube 2.05, I don't even want a square 2.05. I can multiply it by 2 and add 1, but that's not right. That's not the point. So f at 2.05, I believe, is nine point seven one seven sixty five. And 2, we'll just do that one. 8 plus 4 is 12, minus 4 is 8, plus 1 is 9. Which gives us a delta y of 0. 0.717625. We've discovered this. Now let's compare it to the differential. Again, this comes from this. So to find this, we need this, which means we need the derivative. We know our x value is 2, and we know dx is 0.05. 12 plus 4 minus 2 is 12 plus 2, which is 14. That's dy. So our linear approximator, which utilizes the derivative, like what we found here with the differential, actually gives us a closer approximation than this geometric larger difference situation where we actually compute the function values at some desired input and then a little bit further down the road. You can see the error is about 17 uh, thousandths better. So this is called differential approximation or differentials just in general, where you're working with pieces of the derivatives, the tiny pieces dy and dx. And that's basically it for this section. Are there questions on this? This boils down to understanding these geometrically little pieces of x, little pieces of y, and f prime being the derivative. Right? Um, it's a bigger week for homework. Remember I pushed back one of the sections we do this Thursday. So this Thursday, there's quite a bit of homework to do, okay? So let me know if you need an extension or anything, but please also do get to it as soon as you can. Don't wait till Thursday to do all four assignments.
okay? But that concludes chapter three. We'll move on to four next time. If you came in a little late and you didn't get a quiz, come on up to the front and I'll pass it back to you.